Tracy with Watch Kansas, and today we're talking to Adrian Vallejo Foster, who is running for Kansas 3rd District. Good morning, Adrian. Good afternoon, Adrian. How are you doing today? I'm wonderful, Tracy. Thank you so much for asking me to be on Watch Kansas. Oh, we appreciate it so much, and we've been wanting to talk to you, and we finally were able to set up a date, and I'm glad we were able to do this. You know, it's a little bit later. Now, one of the first things we want to uh, kind of go over is a little bit about you. I know that you've got a rich political um, history, and you also have a very rich family history. Do you want to go ahead and kind of tell yeah. Kansas a little bit about that? Absolutely. Um, well, I was born and raised in the 3rd District in Wyandotte County. Grew up at 10th and Central in KCK. I'm a proud dot girl. And uh, youngest of 12, first to go to college in my family. And um, after college, met my husband. We got married. Uh, we've been married 26 years, and we have five boys. And um, during the time that our children were growing up, I had an opportunity to um, help save the Shawnee Indian Mission. And so um, the Shawnee Indian Mission was how I got involved into politics. So um, one night I came home from work, there was a note on the door that said, come to the church tonight um, to save the mission. So I went to my neighbor and I was like, hey, what's this about? And he's like, I'm not sure, but we should go. So I went in and at that time, my youngest son was about 12 months old. And I told my husband, I said, well, I gotta go. I don't know what's going on with the Shawnee Indian Mission. My kids, we. They had a festival every year. We really enjoyed it. So um, he goes, well, you're not going without the baby because I've been with the baby all day. I've been with all five of these boys and I am not, I'm not staying home and, uh, with this, the young one. I was like, okay, I'll take them. So I just finished a whole day of work. I look like a little Mexican girl. I got sweatpants <laughs> on, a t-shirt, my hair rolled up in a bun. I got this baby on my hip. We're going to, the, to this church uh, in Fairway with my neighbor. And we're sitting in the back, and, and uh, my neighbor goes, well, what do you think? And I said, well, you know, I think they need to start a petition, raise some money, and uh, present it to the legislature. And so he goes, okay, you should raise your hand. I said, Jim, do you see what I look like? I'm like, <laughs> oh, my gosh, I'm, you know, I'm not Johnson County presentable. And so um, long story short, he raised his hand, and he is like, yeah, she's got an idea. And here I was, so I took my baby off my hip, I gave him the baby, and then I gave my suggestion, and um, they said, hey, you come to the front of the room. And um, I came to the front of the room, I reiterated what I said, and they said, okay, you're in charge. <laughs> so um, we were very happy um, to get about um, a lot of signatures, raise a lot of money. Um, they presented it to the legislature in Topeka, which um, then created a committee. And to this day, there's a foundation as a result of that. Because of all of that and, and my community service work, um, there was a vacancy at the Roland Park um, City Council seat in my precinct, and they asked me if I would run. And I did, and it was a special election. It was in June of 2005. And long story short, um, I ran against two men. They outspent me, for sure, but they never outworked me. And we went door to door, and we won the special election. And it was a two-year term. I re-ran after that two years. Um, no one ran against me uh, because I was doing such a great job. And I won a four-year term. In the middle of that term, I, um, I was asked by my peers to run uh, for mayor. And they really appreciated my leadership. And so I ran against the incumbent who outspent me once again, uh, <laughs> did outwork me. No one will ever outwork me. and. Uh, by golly, we won. And so then I eventually got to meet Governor Brownback and he appointed me over Hispanic and Latino Affairs. I worked for him for seven and a half years. I also wore multiple hats um, managing over Governor's Grant's office for human trafficking, sexual assault, domestic violence, child advocacy centers, um, juvenile justice, and then also working um, with minority and women um, in the workforce development. So. That gave me a broad um, topic and, and, and worked with many, many of our businesses across the entire state. And then lastly, that gave me the opportunity to uh, work in the Trump administration, uh, being one of 10 across the United States, working on deregulations with our small businesses and kind of being their voice and the watchdog, if you will, uh, for their uh, of small businesses. So that's how I got into politics. 
and um, it's been it's been fun and um, and exciting. And here we are, almost uh, three weeks from tomorrow before um, our big primary. I know. I'm excited about it. Yeah. Now I know um, I used to be involved with Good Place, mm -hmm. and so oh, yeah. I'm very familiar with Shawnee Indian Mission. As a matter of fact, at one point in time, when Grimshaw was partially closed with a part-time administrator. Our part-time administrator was one of the, was the junior administrator from Shawnee Indian Mission. So I spent a lot of time over there. The renovations I got to go through while they were doing some of the renovations. So that was absolutely amazing. And I don't know if anybody's ever worked with the state on something like that, especially with the State Historic Society. They do not just say, oh sure, do what you want to do. They make you fight for everything. And just raising money for historic properties mm -hmm is a lot of work so that just shows right there the work ethic involved and so being able to accomplish that and that if anybody has been over Shawnee Indian Mission or you haven't been if you're an adult you haven't been since you were a kid go because it's more than worth it and you can see all the work that was put in over there and part of their stories is part is about the renovation when you go through on the tours so thank you for that if he's yeah. not aware that you that's how you got involved in politics oh yeah it is a beautiful um, site they have a fall festival every year. Um, my husband and I and a, a bunch of other volunteers, you know, let me just go ahead and say we had a lot of community help um, in order to get the Shawnee Indian Mission and to where it is today. And um, the city of Fairway is a great partner with the Indian Mission currently um, and to help fund it. And, uh, but if you haven't gone, you should definitely go. Definitely, the fall festival is a not miss opportunity. That's whether you're an adult and going by yourself, and if you have kids, you definitely cannot miss that because it's not only educational, but it's fun. The kids won't even realize they're learning something cool. And it's the second full Saturday in October. So that's how you always remember it. So the second full Saturday in October, guarantee you'll be there. Excellent. Well, now, I know you were talking about um, your family growing up. Mm -hmm. And you've got some brothers that have done some pretty amazing things too, haven't you? Well, I'll tell you, um, so I have five brothers and six sisters. Um, and I, uh, two of my brothers are Kansas City, Kansas police officers. Um, I have a nephew also that's a KCK police officer. And I have about 20 first cousins who are Kansas City, Kansas police officers. Don't get me started on the fire department. But, uh, <laughs> but we, we come from a very large family. And, um, you know, I'm truly grateful uh, for my parents because they they gave us an incredible foundation, a, a belief in family and faith and freedom. And those are three core, when people think about Hispanics and Mexicans, and I'm Mexican, it, they don't really think Republican. But those three core values are very Hispanic and they're very Republican. I mean, we all believe in God. We believe in protecting life. We believe in less government in our lives, and our especially in our business um, and education. And um, so that is very Republican values. And we have many um, family members that are JFK Democrats, and they're finally seeing the light, honestly. They're seeing that, you know what? Um, the Democrat Party has left them. It, they, it is not the party that used to be who they believed in and who they are always looked up to. And I'm interesting enough, um, I want to say it was about this time last year and my sister, we, you know, we had been talking about me running and she's like, you know, we don't have anyone to vote for in the Democrat party as for president at that time. She goes, you know, I don't believe in socialism. So there was no Bernie. She's like, and Joe can't figure out even what his name is or who's his wife. So, I mean, she was like, so could we have, you know, somebody else other than, you know, uh, President Trump? Because they still, no matter what, they still don't like Trump. But they do see that he had got the economy going. It was our best economy ever. We had the lowest unemployment rate for Hispanics, lowest unemployment rate for African Americans and lowest unemployment rate for women. And when you're talking about Wyandotte County, that hits them all. And they were all working, and we need that back had it not been for COVID. So we can talk about that whenever you want to. <laughs> sure, well, even with COVID, the economy has had a quick rebound, and unemployment rate is down substantially already in just the short few weeks. Mm -hmm. So even with that, like we're saying, Trump's made, what was it? 
14 percent the other day, mm -hmm. which was a jump from like you know like half. Sure. In just what six or eight weeks, something like that. Now, don't quote my numbers if you're going to use me for a source <laughs> later. But I know it. But I know it's somewhere around in there. Um, now, in addition to that, you're a mom. I am. I am. And so you. So I know the kids are big, and but that's still that, that's a lot of responsibility. And how is your family behind you on all this? Are, are they excited? Oh my gosh. Well, first of all, we have been walking for about I think seven weeks now. Every Saturday. Um, so my youngest son is 15, um, so he's in high school, he's yeah. a sophomore, going into be his junior year. I have one that's in college, he just finished his freshman year, and then um, three are out of the house. And they are all super supportive. Um, I finally got a daughter with my daughter-in-law awesome. um, last year, and um, they are, they all come into the office throughout the day, and they'll stop off at their lunch hour, and they'll just be like, you can do it, Mom. They're super supportive. <laughs> and God bless my husband. You know, one of us had always been at home, and I was the breadwinner for a long time, and we made that decision when they were younger. But, you know, I was um, working for in the Trump administration prior to running, and it was the best job I ever had in my entire life. I had the dream job. I was making the most money I had ever made. Um, but we made a big sacrifice to run because it meant sure. that much to us. And that also meant that my husband had to figure out, okay, he had a, a part-time teaching job. And he thought, okay, well, what is he going to do? And he decided that he would be an electrician. And so at 58 years young, he is an apprentice for an electrical union. And um, it is hard work. Yeah. Those guys are in the the cold, the rain, and the heat, and um, but he's met some really quality guys and a lot of union guys who are Republican and are huge Trumpsters, wow. and yeah, and so it's been uh, really enlightening to him, and he's lost like 20 pounds. He's looking good. <laughs> I love that. Anyway, um, I don't want to digress, but, yeah. um, but I have great family support. My sisters and brothers are very supportive. My mother, who is 90 years young, she turned 90 years old during this whole COVID thing back on May 18th. And um, she's super supportive, and we just can't wait to be able to see her because she's part of the vulnerable population with other a lot of health risk, and we don't want to get her sick. So, um, super supportive. So now, since you mentioned COVID, and we've got a lot of things going on with that. One of the big debates is what does it actually? How does it actually spread? Mm -hmm. And they're not really sure yet. They're not positive how it spreads the most. I know. I think. Um, we've got the big mask debate. Some people wear masks, some people don't. Depends on where I'm at, I may. Depends on where I'm at, I may, I may not. Um, we've been a lot of places last weekend, so when my five-year-old nephew comes to visit, my sister says, um, I've been wearing masks for a few days, for okay. a couple of weeks. And I'm fine with that. And he's kind of fine with that, but sometimes he'll say, how far is six feet? Can you sit over there? I'm tired of wearing the mask. <laughs> and so, We'll put him yeah. on the other side of the room. Or if he has dinner with us, we will set him one spot and we'll put him on and we'll yeah. so everybody can remove their masks and relax and eat. And we make sure that he doesn't feel ostracized. Sure. We you know make sure he gets to lead the conversation. Sure. So that way he doesn't feel like he's being put out. And I know there's a big a lot of conversations about school when you've got a school aged child. Mm -hmm. um, what are your thoughts on all of that? And you know, sure. Are you pro mask, pro not mask? <laughs> does it are you does it kind of go with the situation and how do you feel about return to school? Sure. Well I'll start with the school. So I believe we need to return the children back to school. Now, not everyone is the same. Not all one size fits all. We understand that. Um, in government and in education, especially with times like this with COVID nineteen. And until we know and learn more. But what we do know is that um, children need to be do their best learning in the school. Um, and so, but we do have individuals, I have a, a, a nephew who is in his late 20s, um, had cancer early on, um, has, is high risk. He works, um, but he works from home. Um, him and his wife have two small children, under three, so um, they can't go to daycare yet because you know, he's at high risk. Now, if their children were older, 
he would still have that same scenario, right? Um, they probably couldn't go to school because they don't want dad to be um, part of that population and, and get cause any infection because he seriously is high risk. So not all you know uh, scenarios um, are the same, but we have um, personal responsibility, and I think it's up to the parents um, to decide if their child should go uh, learn from a distance or learn in the seeds. I'm very blessed that all my children are healthy. We have no pre-existing conditions, and we don't have you know juvenile diabetes or any other kinds of concerns. And so, um, you know, I am fine with my my son going back to high school. I'm fine with my son going back to college. Um, but it has taken a mental strain off a lot of teenagers um, to not have that social interaction. Um, you know, z you know, learning via Zoom is distance learning. And it's not for everyone. Yeah. And so, um, and I would say the mask is also personal responsibility. Um, my neighbors um, both work uh, for a major um, health system here. And they said, you know, we're not seeing the numbers at the hospital. And um, when I visit with them in the evenings and they have a baby, um, they don't wear a mask. I don't wear a mask. We're outside. We're, you know, um, I don't know if we're completely social distancing, but they hand me their baby and I get to hold her. <laughs> She's so beautiful, baby Sawyer. And, um, and so, and they work in hospitals and I'm not afraid and they're not afraid. Um, but we really, we see the numbers are diminishing. We do see a higher number of um, cases just because more people are being tested. Right. But what is not being said in the media is that just because you're tested and you're tested positive, there's a lot of false positives as well as there's a lot of positives where no one's sick. So um, I think we need to take it slowly, but I think the children need to go back to school. And, you know, um, kind of like the mask as well. So. Um, I'll tell you, I love my nail place, my nail technicians. I've gone there for 20 years. She's over off mission, nail technician. I love her to death. But in order for me to go get my nails done, she requires a mask and for me to wear a mask and for her to wear a mask. And if I want to patronize her business, I'm going to follow her rules. Sure. And there's nothing wrong with that because she owns that business. And it's up to every business owner to make that decision for them. But she also... Um, protects her employees. They all wear the PPE um, and so the, the protection um, equipment and I understand that as well. So um, it's not a one-size-fits-all and so that's what I would say about those education and in regards to mask and no mask. I agree and I know in Kansas one of the big things is they have not only through the schools, if some of the schools are doing distance learning or if they offer both options when they come back, I'm not sure what they're doing in different districts will do different things, but Kansas itself has an online education program. Mm -hmm. And so even if your local school doesn't, if you're not comfortable with your children going to school, you can go ahead and you can do the distance learning through Kansas or you can actually as homeschool if you have the ability and the resources. Everybody doesn't, I think mm -hmm. a lot of times the people that have the least resources to do distance learning or to do homeschooling are the students that are going to need it most, more likely the students that are most at risk educationally and economically. You know, Tracy, that is a great point because um, I was just discussing this earlier today. Um, we have an education committee and they said, well, what, let's talk about those parents that both of them work, okay? They both work. Their children all need to go to school, but they can't get they um, but they have to social distance learning. They do that. Their internet's terrible, and there's only one laptop for them to use. So when do you pick and choose which child gets to use it? On top of that, if both parents are working, now they have to make a decision: Are you going to go to work, or am I going to go to work? And so there's so many different scenarios and I don't know how we answer that all right now. It's a local issue and exactly. it's a state issue. And um, and so I hope that there's a lot of continuing conversations regarding those two issues. And we have to think about those um, that don't have high speed internet, don't have access to you know multiple laptops. And then again, deciding which parent's gonna be home and not home. 
in a lot of cases, you've got single families, you have, in Wyandotte County especially, we've got a lot of people that are lower socioeconomic, so mm -hmm. they don't have the option of choosing who's gonna stay home, who's not. They have to go to work if they're gonna feed the kids. And they're also, in some cases, every parent doesn't have, whether it's by choice or by their education, to help their kids with school at oh, home. Right. And those are the kids, the kids whose parents aren't able to help, most need to be in the schools or have the option to be, because those are the kids that public education best helps because that is how that raises them out of poverty, is the education. Ab absolutely. Whether, whether it's distance learning or whether it's in the classroom, and like I said, parents need to be able to make those decisions for their families. Tracy, I agree 100%. You know, education is the equalizer yes. that helps us get out of poverty. You know, growing up at 10th and Central, you know, being the youngest of 12, again, I said, you know, I was the first to go to college and um, for multiple reasons, but education is what got to me to where I am today. And I'm very fortunate of that. And, um, and so education is important and we just need to figure it out because we all have different scenarios and we all are brought up in different socioeconomical, um, you know, distinctions and we just need to, to figure that one out. I agree completely. Mm -hmm. and I like that you're giving you back to the individual responsibility and individual options mm -hmm. instead of just the one size fits all that tends to be frequently the option that's given. Right. Well, and I would just say, you know, and that's why, you know, I believe, and if we could uh, get rid of the uh, U.S. Department of Education, I know that's not uh, something that we can actually do, but what we can do though is we can make sure that we pull the U.S. Department of Education out of the swamp or out of Washington DC and bring it to the Midwest just like we brought the U.S. Department of Agriculture so they can see firsthand who we are and believe me not all of them are going to want to come to Kansas or Missouri or Oklahoma but that's okay because they can stay there we don't want them as voters anyway so um, I'm so good with that. <laughs> That's his, that is my least favorite because, once again, it's a one side, they try to do the one size fits all and you can't legislate from D.C. Mm -hmm. what kids in Kansas, Missouri, Oklahoma, or California mm -hmm. are working with. That is, that's exactly it. And they've tried that so many times um, prior to the Trump administration. Um, every, uh, you know, No Child Left Behind, Every Child Succeeds Act. Um, I'm, I'm a big... Um, advocate for homeschooling. Um, I think a lot of parents right now um, who had sent their children to public schools or private schools are saying, you know what, I can do a better job and or I don't want to see this social emotional learning that's infiltrated into our school system. That's a whole nother podcast, Tracy. <laughs> um, and so, um, so I'll stay on cue with the uh, federal issues, but yeah, I mean, education, the best decisions is locally made and uh, less government intervention. Exactly. Now with less government intervention, what other things do you think that are going on? And what, what's, if, when you go to Washington in a different capacity, mm -hmm. what would be first on your agenda? What changes would you like to, be, would you like to see or what programs would you like to see continued? Well, Tracy, that's a great question because we have been visiting over 14,000 Republican voters in the 3rd Congressional District. We, I personally knocked on over 2,000 doors, and if I had to get up and uh, you, it would still be in videotaped, it would be like rickety cricket because I am so <laughs> sore. I don't know why um, in Olathe this past weekend there was a lot of inclines and stairs that I um, ran up and down. But, um, you know, the number one issue that they're saying is, we want the economy back up. We want what we had just back in January. January feels like it's been years ago. Um, you know, with the lowest unemployment rates and everything and our economy booming. And the way that that economy was booming was uh, based off of a two for one executive order that said for every new regulation that the federal government passed, you had to get rid of two. But really what it said was, if that new regulation cost $1 million, you had to get rid of 
one million dollars worth of expenses from a regulation and so in 2018 when i was uh, with the small business administration the average number of regulations for every new regulation was 24 regulations out wow okay like that. and in, in 2019 it was less but i'll tell you i think for every new regulation i think it was like 14 and a, and a half but it was still a significant number. And we see firsthand that by deregulating and getting government out of your business, out of your education, out of your health care, Democrats want socialized medicine. That's what it's all about in regards to health care. And we'll talk about health care. But the economy, getting the economy back open by cutting regulations is number one. We also had you know, um, tax reform as well, and that helped our economy going. But the number two issue that you know the third congressional district um, residents want is also health care reform and when we talk about health care people are like oh are you for the you know uh, repealing um, the affordable health care repeal and replace well let me tell you the fact of the matter is this the affordable health care has been gutted so much by president trump there's not much left to repeal okay so does it need to be replaced? Absolutely. How do we do that? Well, the number one problem that we have with healthcare, Tracy, is this. We don't have a healthcare system problem. We have a healthcare cost problem. Yes. We are in an age of job mobility, technology. What you guys want is affordable, portable, and highly personalized healthcare. Yes. We can do that. There's a plan out there that's been started by the Republican the Republicans, I can't believe it, it was great. Bev Gossage, she is a great friend of mine and has educated not only me, but many of all of us that are running. And I have learned firsthand what deregulations, um, deregulating our health savings account, deregulating so that we can buy insurance across state line to increase um, competition. And you know, one other thing too, is that if you ask an insurance company, who is your customer? And you know what they're gonna say, Tracy? The employer. Well, let's change that. Let's change that so that the employee is now the customer. Yeah. And we can do that with deregulation. And we can, with a portable, affordable, highly personalized care, it can be done. The Republican Study uh, Committee has an incredible package. I'm gonna tweak it and bring it over to the House. Perfect, I like that. Now, you told not only the um, employer, and the employee, but there's a lot of people that retire early. Mm -hmm. Your brothers, police officers tend to retire a little bit earlier. It's a very stressful job. <gasps> and they tend to have an earlier retirement, but a lot of them can't retire mm -hmm. simply because they cannot afford a family plan. Right. Or even insurance in general, but they can't afford insurance. So unless they're married with a spouse that continues to work, how would that play out in that situation? Would it also be something to where it would benefit the person that's buying it and also the small business owner where they're buying it personally and not through a business? Well, they, there was something called, and the, and the president um, was working on this, where you could buy, you could pool your small businesses and you can pool the trades. And that would, um, that higher uh, uh, pool would actually keep down your insurance. But we have to start early. And so let me give you an example. So my, 20, my oldest son is 25 years young. Um, thank goodness, again, he's, uh, he's working, he works for a nice employer, he has no pre-existing conditions, but the employer's like investing, let's just say, um, $7,000 on his plan. So you sign up, you, okay, let's just say you get Blue Cross and Blue Shield. Well, there's everything in that plan right now. So he's single, he doesn't have any children, he's not married, nothing like that. But when you have that big plan, you've got health care, you've got mental health, you've got all kinds of things into that. Well, what if the employer said, and we would have to um, still give the employer the tax credit for doing this, and said, okay, my son's name's Steven. Steven, I, you can pick my plan, and I'll put that $7,000 to pay that plan, or I could put that $7,000 in your health savings account. Now you go look for the insurance that you need. Now, let's, let's think about this again. Let's think about auto insurance. Do I need full coverage or do I need limited liability? Well, my cars are all like 2000 and 2001 <laughs> and 2002, and so I don't need full coverage because you know what happens when you get full coverage, right? It costs a lot more money. Yes, and they're not gonna necessarily pay out on it. That's right, they're, they're not. Older, they're older. 
That's right. My son, though, 25, he only needs limited liability, meaning he only needs insurance if he gets into, uh, if he breaks a leg from playing soccer, because he loves playing soccer, still at 25, and um, he thinks he's only like 18. And, um, and so we had those type of plans back in the 1950s yes. and 60s, and we need to bring those back. And so now, his insurance just became portable because once he goes and finds and shops around and finds out what he needs, right? Limited insurance for what he needs. Then he can start saving and take that insurance with him. It stops pre-existing conditions because if he should decide to at, 20, at 27 years old to go find another job somewhere else and he's still paying his insurance on his, his type of insurance that he needs, it has now become portable. Now, as we're aging differently, we're going to need full coverage, sure. you know, um, and um, we won't need all those other items. So again, with my son, um, he has that ability to have that health savings account. He can build it up while he's young, and then later on in life, as he ages, that will grow with him, and he'll be able to provide some of that health um, coverage that he needs um, when he's older in life. You know, for our small businesses, to go back to that, um, you know, when, once you have deregulations and you're allowing um, other insurance companies to go across state lines and you're able to shop around, the market will then uh, reduce its prices. There will be increased competition and that increased competition will help those um, small businesses be able to have affordable, portable, um, more specialized, personalized health care that they're looking for, not only for themselves, but for their probably family members and many of their small businesses. Um, a husband and wife team or a brother and sister and and they can do that and it can be affordable I know when I was younger my parents didn't have an, a one-size-fits-all policy I know we had major medical mm -hmm. and when we went to the doctor my parents paid out of pocket for doctor's visits and the advantage of that was that when the doctor's offices don't have to spend all of their time and spend so many additional resources and so much money filing insurance they can do it for a lot less money because a lot of the time one of the biggest part of the office costs, office visits, are how much money, not the time you spend with the doctor, but how much money behind the scenes they have to spend filing all of that. And if you could walk in, it might reduce it from $150 a visit down to $50, $60, $70, but you can choose to pay out of pocket. No, I, I agree um, as well. You know, interesting enough, um, I was getting my um, yearly checkup back in August of last year, and um, I was visiting with my primary care physician, and I said, um, I said, you know, I'm getting ready, you know, I'm thinking about running for Congress, and I'd love your input, and, he, and I said, what's, what's your biggest challenge? And he said, electronic medical records and the software needed to keep them up to date because of all the insurance companies, what the requirements, and because of all the federal requirements that is re, um, required as well, that that cost of um, being, you know, complying with the regulations as well as having the accurate um, and data computers and then all of their staff members needing to get updated. And that's all, a lot of human capital goes into also, you know, time and training to do those electronic medical records. And um, so, I mean, there, there's a lot of challenges right now um, for our physicians as well and all the different compliances that they have to go through. You know, we've covered quite a bit. Now we're talking about um, recovered COVID in healthcare and we hit upon your brothers a little bit. Mm -hmm. And your, not just your brothers, but your family and that your family is very service oriented. Mm -hmm. Therefore, a lot of your family have went into service-oriented jobs, such as the police departments, the fire departments. Mm -hmm. So should we just defer that? Absolutely not. So I think that was one of the most ridiculous things I've ever, ever heard of. Defunding the police in Wyandotte County, first of all, uh, that is, it's asinine. That's the only word that I can come up with. You know, I always thought that uh, politicians had a thankless job, but being a police officer is definitely a thankless job. So let's think about this. Let's let's think about uh, you may have a relative that's a police officer, or you may not have anyone that is a police officer. But let me tell you what a police officer does. First of all, they get paid pennies. 
number one. Number two, they put their life on the line every day for all of us, okay? And for, the, for us to think about defunding them, there are over 800,000 law enforcement individuals across the United States. And to profile all of them that they're the same is absolutely so wrong because not everyone is perfect, okay? And um, in, in, every, in any kind of occupation, but to profile them all as bad apples is so wrong. And so do we need more training for some of our police officers? Absolutely. And that is what I would say we need to do. But to defund them, uh, they, Tracy, the next thing they wanna do is, and they've always been after our guns, I'm very pro second amendment. So let's just say this. That was my next question. Yeah, oh, well, no <laughs> problem. I'm just gonna say, so you wanna take our police away, then you wanna take our guns away. Um, next thing they're gonna say, Let's take our military away. Well, thank you, President Obama. You tried that. And thank God for President Trump, who has been funding them. But come on. This is ridiculous. So I am absolutely not for defunding our police officers. Okay, we're talking about more training. I don't think we have too many police officers going to disagree. They could use some more training in a lot of things either. Do you? You know what, um, when I was over the governor's grants office, I um, one of the initiatives that we did was um, actually uh, funding a lot of our police officers um, across the um, state of Kansas in regards to domestic violence because every police officer will tell you that the number one high incident scariest um, call you can go on is a domestic violence call and so we needed to we saw that we needed to educate them more and we had a federal grant that funded our law enforcement from all across the state um, in regards to domestic violence, and um, that was very important. We can do those same type of programs um, now because oftentimes many of our um, police um, law enforcement agencies and police stations, especially um, municipalities and counties, they all apply for federal dollars called the Burn JAG, um, the Byron's, uh, the Burn JAG grant. And so that will, they have a bulletproof vest. They also um, provide funding for uh, dogs. Um, they provide funding for armored cars. They provide funding for you name it. And so uh, we get a certain dollar amount every year allocated to the state and they can increase that dollar amount to each state based off the population so that we can have additional funding um, to help resolve that issue. Um, and I will also want to say one more thing. Um, our unions know exactly who the bad apples are. And so we need to work with them as well and give them an incentive to um, move those police officers on and also identify who they are so they don't go to another uh, municipality. Okay, now, so we went ahead and um, the Second Amendment, the other big conservative value question is pro-life. I am 100% pro-life from womb to tomb with no exceptions, zero. And I can tell you, um, I know you've talked with other candidates, but I'm the only candidate that actually um, debated Gloria Steinem. Oh, really? Yes, so I was the, the mayor of Roland Park at that time. I was also working for Governor Brownback, so I was doing both jobs. Um, during my lunch hour, I would uh, get calls from my city administrator and, and he'd be like, hey, uh, the UMKC Women's Symposium would like you to be on this panel in a couple weeks. And so I accepted it and I did some prep calls and it's the it, it was Friday night before the event and I'm prepping for it. We had put all the kids down to sleep and I'm talking to my husband. He's like, what are you preparing for? And I was like, well, um, I'm gonna be on this panel, but we've got some really strange questions. And um, so I'm going through the questions with him, and he's like, so who's the moderator? And I said, oh, some woman named Gloria Steinem. He goes, what? Now, mind you, my husband's 10 years older than I am. And so, um, you know, I just said Gloria Steinem. He goes, oh, certainly, you must be wrong. And I said, well, no, 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 here's the sheet. I printed it off, and uh, her name's Gloria Steinem. And he goes, Google her. It's funny, because back then, I would always tell my husband, 
Google it. And so I, I, uh, I Googled her and I found out, oh my gosh, she is, you know, the founder of feminism. You know, she's the bra burner woman. And so I was like, oh my gosh, I didn't sleep that whole night. The next morning, um, my husband's like, maybe, maybe I should go with you. And I was like, are you kidding me? No one's going to bring their husbands to that event. You know, I'm like, <laughs> so, um, I, I had my little purse with me and my holy water, my rosary. I'm Catholic. So, uh, Went off to the event, and um, it was quite an event. Carol Marinovich was the mayor of Unified Government at that time, and uh, Mayor Kay Barnes was for KCMO. So all three of us were on this panel um, in a breakout session with Gloria, where only uh, like 100 women were supposed to fit in this room, and 250 people fit in that room. And so the first question was, you know, who was your mentor, things like that. And I said, my husband. That there was a roar in the room for that one. Anyway, uh, but the last question was that Gloria asked, and she says, are you pro-life or pro-choice? So Carol Marinovich said pro-choice, Kay Barnes said pro-choice, and I said pro-life. Well, the room kind of erupted once again, and um, Gloria came right behind me, put her arms on my shoulder, which I was terrified because she's a Wiccan, and I didn't want her taking my hair. <laughs> and um, anyway, so I said, um, uh, no, she goes, Mayor Foster meant to say that she chooses life for herself, and she has that right to choose for herself. And I said, oh, no, and I stand up, and I said, no, 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 I choose life for everyone. And I said, Dolores Hurtado, who's the Hispanic Gloria Steinem, I go, is that you back there? And she's like, yeah, and I go, I choose life for you. And I said, Mary Lou, is that you who runs El Centro? And she goes, yes. I go, I choose life for you. And in the front row were a bunch of women from um, this, from uh, that are residents of Roland Park. And I said, you guys are my residents, right? In Roland Park? And they're like, yeah. And I go, I choose life for you. In fact, I choose life for everyone in this room. And so the room erupted. Gloria said, oh, okay, okay, this is a good time for lunch. And we went off. So that is my Gloria Steinem. True story. Um, and... I'm very proud to be pro-life, 100%, like I said, womb to tomb, no exceptions. I don't think there's any doubt about what you're saying. That one. <laughs> and I respect that because so often people will give you a quick, oh, yes, I'm pro-life, oh, you know, or, well, a wishy-washy answer, and nobody's really for sure where they stand. Mm -hmm. I like the fact that everything we've talked about, there's no doubt where you stand. Mm -hmm. You are very upfront very forward, very people know exactly what they're going to get with you. And we seldom get that in politics. Mm -hmm. And I personally appreciate that very much. Well, I've been tried and tested, um, you know, throughout all the positions that I had. And that's why I think I'm the best candidate that can win in the third congressional district. We can win this seat back from yes. Sharice Davids, 100%. Um, you know, Sharice is an American Indian, outwardly lesbian woman. Well, what better way to beat an outwardly lesbian American Indian woman with a Hispanic woman who's married who has five children? That's from the dot. <laughs> I'm just saying. And it's been a long time since we've had a serious national candidate from the dot. That it has been quite some time. It's been quite some time. I do not have the last have any idea when the last one may have been. So I'm really impressed with that. I think that's amazing. Well, I'll tell you. Not only would the, um, I think I'd be the first in quite some time, um, I don't think we've had a, one from Wyandotte that I can remember right now at the top of my head, but um, I will be the first Hispanic woman to be elected in Kansas for the 3rd Congressional District That's amazing. when I'm elected in November. So would you say that would make you the bridge to our future? I say yes. I say yes, and that's how we can get more Republicans or more people from Wyandotte County who are registered Democrat to become unaffiliated. Because I'll tell you, all my family in Wyandotte County are Democrats, but they have registered to become unaffiliated. They couldn't make the push to Republican, but it's okay. <laughs> We're, it's baby steps because, as you know, in the primary, you can ask for a Republican ballot as an unaffiliated, and that's what they were. Gonna, that's what they're all going to do. Um, come August 4th, three weeks from tomorrow. Excellent. Now, if someone wants to get a hold of you and they want to say, hey, I absolutely love what Adrian has to say, 
I would absolutely love to X, Y, Z, make phone calls, make a donation. Yeah. Hey, she sounds like a fun person. Can I go walk with her this Saturday? How do they get a hold of you? Well, you can go to our website, adrianforkansas.com, and that's Adrian, A-D-R-I-E-N-N-E-F-O-R-K-A-N-S-A-S.com. That's the easiest way to do. Go hit on the contact um, or volunteer, or you can send us a Facebook post. Again, it's uh, Foster for Kansas. Um, much easier than spelling my first name of Adrian. <laughs> <laughs> and I know um, one thing I always like to do is let you know how easy candidates are to get a hold of. I've had no problem. Whether it's Adrian personally doesn't always answer because there's such an influx and she's so busy, <laughs> but one of her people will get with you back immediately. And if you want to talk to Adrian personally, you can about something. And there's a lot of events. She's always available. You can stop by. You can meet her. You can talk to her. But she's she and her campaign officer are very easy to get a hold of. Why do I like to go ahead and specify that? Because right now you want something from us. You want your a vote. I want to earn your vote. But if you can't, if we can't get a hold of you right. when you want our vote, sure, we're not going to be able to get a hold of you when we need something from you later. That's why I always like to specify: if we can get a hold of you now, we can get a hold of you later. Oh, absolutely, and that is a fact. And so um, you can always stop by our office. We're here um, Monday through Friday. Saturdays we're walking, and so we, we're walking on Sundays as well. But we're located at 6717 Shawnee Mission Parkway, Suite B. And so we are here. So you can stop by, and we would be glad to have you help um, answer calls or make phone calls for us, put signs together, put signs out, and um, anything else. But um, and I'm always in the office and um, very accessible. And again, if you want to talk, you can also just send us a, a message via Facebook or Snapchat or LinkedIn. You name it, we're on it. So I appreciate everything you're uh, doing for all of us in the 3rd Congressional District. More importantly, what, what Tracy and what Watch Kansas does is help inform everyone. Yes. And information is always power. Education is power. But the worst thing you can have is an uninformed voter. So I encourage you guys to, um, you know, make us earn your vote because your vote means a lot. And we need everyone out voting, not only in the primary, but especially in November. 100%. And if you notice, if you've watched many of the Watch Kansas videos, you've noticed that they're usually pretty relaxed mm -hmm. and casual. The reason behind that is, there's a lot of advertisement that all the candidates put out on Facebook. You have to, you've got to let people know your name. Watch Kansas wants to help you get to know the candidate, not just a few of the issues. So I think we've really done that a lot today. We've really learned yeah. a lot about you and about who you are and what you stand for and what you're gonna do for Kansas. I'm very excited and I'm ready to work for you. I'm ready to take your voice to Washington DC and your values. Is there anything that you would like to add to it or anything that you want to go over before we wrap it up? Well, I would just say again, um, your vote is very important to all of us. Um, do the research, see who the candidate is, um, test it out. You know, see if you can reach out and get hold of that candidate. Um, because how they are in the, in the campaign and campaign it is how they're gonna be when they are your congressperson. And so that is very important. And, um, you know, I, I learned my, my values of family, faith, and freedom from my parents, and they're very hard workers, and I pledge to you that I will always work hard for you, and I feel like I am you, and you are me, and I'm going to take you to Washington, D.C. Thank you very much. We appreciate Adrian. Thank you. This is Tracy and Adrian with Watch Kansas. Have a great day.